This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming. This is Mitch Gen. We're going to talk about toxic metals tonight. I'm going to share my screen with you. Let's just get into this. And at the end, I'll save time. So if there's any questions, certainly I'll be glad to um, answer them when we're done. So let's see, we get this going. All righty. Here we go. All right. Just um, someone tell me that you can see the screen and we'll get going and get started. Someone a mic. We can see yeah. the screen. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So there's no way you could do a practice um, in medicine, pretty much in any field from rheumatology right down the line to neurology. Uh, any of the internal medicine specialties without being seriously uh, in in uh, grained and understanding the toxic metals. They have so much negative they do to the human body that with the best of intentions and protocols that you'll prescribe for your patients, without knowing where, how, and why a toxic metal occurs and what to do with it, you probably have let a lot of patients slip through the cracks. But tonight, I'm going to hopefully start part one of three-part series of access laboratories to be able to show you first tonight what's a toxic metal. Some of it may be uh, renewed in your head from hearing it before. For others, I hope there'll be lots of things this evening that you'll look at that will certainly say, oh, okay, I understand. And then part two will be how to diagnose this particular um, problem and the different types of toxic metals. And lastly, the third part will be, how do we treat this? So if you'll stay with us tonight and then the next two times in the next coming months, hopefully you'll take along with that a lot of information on how to do this. First tonight, I think if I can just impress on you that the toxic metals are pretty much ubiquitous, they're uh, pervasive, they're invasive, and they pretty much attack all systems of the human body. And we certainly overlook them way too much. If I can just get that to you this evening, then I've done a great job. And hopefully on top of that, you'll get a lot more. So let's get into this and see what it's all about. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about what are the toxic metals? Where do they come from? What are the environmental and health effects? How do you get exposed to these things? Um, how do you, you know, toxic metals, how do they cause damage? How do they cause free radicals? And what happens to the essential min minerals like selenium, iron, copper, and zinc, some of them which are actually part of the um, periodic chart in the heavy metal category? How do we um, discern if they're causing a problem or not? Or are these other toxic metals robbing these essential minerals from our body, which they do. So we'll describe that as we go along very carefully. So here are the toxic metals. There's um, a lot of them in this list, um, as you can see. And it goes all the way from aluminum through copper, through thallium, tin, um, and all the way through uranium. Now, some of these are less toxic than others. There's a big difference between being very toxic and not toxic. And I want to start off this evening with a definition, which will be important. There is a huge difference between a toxic metal and a heavy metal. We should probably as clinicians drop the terminology heavy metal from our vocabulary because a heavy metal does not necessarily cause a problem. The toxic metals are just that. They are toxic. And as you see, as we'll go on, even in small amounts, they can become extremely toxic. So toxic metal characteristics are the ones that you see to the left here. They can lose an electron. They become positively charged. They're oxidized. They have really no biological function. At this moment, for pretty much for a toxic metal, not a heavy metal, a toxic metal, we do not have any good use in human nutrition for its addition to, you know, to our uh, daily eating habits. They can, and they do, disrupt essential physiologic processes, 
And again, what I said, heavy metal is not necessarily a toxic metal is very different. Well, let me give you an example. If you have looked at the periodic chart in the past, whenever since you looked at it, you'll recall that in the heavy metal category, there are things like iron. Now, iron, of course, uh, can be toxic in large doses, but it is required in human nutrition. So it's classified as a heavy metal, not a toxic metal. Gold, for example, is also in the heavy metal category, but it is a dense, um, not toxic substance for the most part. And we used gold, we used to use it in rheumatoid situations, but more so now we use gold uh, in the cancer courses that we teach because gold um, uh, blocks thioreductase. And by the way, it significantly increases uh, the potency of our vitamin C, especially if you're using it intravenously. So these things can form stable and long lasting complexes with sulfur biological molecules. What does that mean? It basically means that once these things enter the body, if they're not removed early on, they can be around for years and years and years. A heavy or toxic metal typically doesn't have a, a, a half-life. For example, mercury doesn't have a half-life. You could pour mercury in the ground and you could go find it a thousand years from now. It's as good as your own body or your patient's body detoxification processes will allow to get rid of it. But the half-life is really something we sometimes, oh, well, mercury could have a half-life of 50 years. Actually, it doesn't have a half-life at all. It will basically stay intact in the body until the body actually removes it. So toxic metals are characteristics to on-go. They substitute, as you can see, for some of our minerals that we require, like cadmium for zinc, uh, lead for calcium, lead also for iron. Uh, they definitely destruct the structure of uh, proteins, which we will talk about in a, in a moment. Uh, the, uh, they remove electron from the basis of DNA. And you're probably saying, what does this do? What does this mean? And I think it will be very clear to you, hopefully, just in a few moments of talking about this. So here are the end result. I'll put the end result at the beginning and then again at the very end in the summary so you can see and recall. The effects of toxic metals are pretty much neurotoxic, nephrotoxic, cardiovascular, dysregulation of the immune system. Uh, they compromise gastrointestinal integrity and nutritional status, obviously, as you saw in the pre previous slide. They are carcinogenic and they are mutagenic. Well, these substances obviously hit pretty much every system in the human body, which means that the amount of diseases that they can participate in the um, creating of are huge, and they do. So again, uh, just trying to underscore the importance of your learning about this and having this in your vocabulary. So what happens is toxic metals can disrupt organ function as well. The heart, uh, we'll show you in a minute. The brain, again, we'll show you the bone, the liver, and the kidney. And we'll show this several times in different ways so that it becomes imprinted. So this slide basically is saying, here's what happens in a toxic metal. Look on the left side first, and you see pretty much a litany of disorders from MS uh, right down the line to depression, to TIG, weight gain, cardiovascular, cholesterol, digestive hormone, libido issues. Now you can imagine these kind of things enter pretty much everyone that's listening office on a regular basis. So if we overlook the toxic metal component to this, we may get a good result, but we may have gotten a much better result had we investigated this flesh, the, the presence of any of these metals. On the right side of the screen, you begin to see how it does its dastardly deeds. So you see the heavy or really should be toxic metal toxicity. And what happens is you see the creation of reactive oxygen species. And pretty much it's all the oxygen species that you've ever read about. Superoxide, anions, hydrogen peroxide, the hydroxyl ion, nitric oxide. Yes, I know nitric oxide is an important component of vasodilatation, endothelial lining health, and we'll show that. But in large doses, it is a toxic, um, a toxic gas. 
And then you have other reactive oxygen species that you've read about, of course, the perioxyl and the rest, all causing problems and eventually causing what we call an oxidative burst. Now, ongoing oxidative burst, remember, this is not something that you just, you know, ate something and you're getting reactive oxygen species from what you eat, you, and then you could perhaps take an antioxidant. This is something that is ongoing because of the presence, and unless it's removed, in addition to all the other things that onslaught a human every day, this is constantly in the background creating reactive oxygen species. So you can see how this added effect can have some serious health consequences. So if you look, for example, right under oxidative burst, you'll see that you can end up with lipid peroxidation. Of course, if you are testing, and hopefully you will, or are for malandaldehyde in your office, you'll pretty much know whether they're getting that problem. That is a big problem because lipid peroxidation means that the cell membrane is being fractured. Um, then you see there may be protein content abnormality or oxidation of protein. You, we often look for hemoglobin A1C, which would direct us to that because that isn't a marker of oxidative damage to the protein. And then you have, which will happen eventually, DNA damage which you would only see if you would measure in one of your testing companies, 8-hydroxy-D-guanosine. The bottom line, again, is on this right side, how does it cause the pro these problems? Because it causes serious reactive oxygen species. On the left side, it's saying, look at all the diseases that are potential problems, either in part or solely or initiated by or whatever uh, when it comes to toxic metals. So... Toxic metals, um, uh, especially the uh, transition metals, promote lipid peroxidation. Some of you may be saying, well, wait, wait, what's a transition metal? Transition metals are that part of the periodic chart, which, by the way, contains the heavy metals, contains the toxic metals, and sort of shoulders up against two sides of the periodic chart, um, but basically saying that toxic metals do promote lipid peroxidation, the OONO or the perioxynitrate free radical. Again, you can identify the amount someone has by doing malandaldehyde assays on these people. Um, we also find that these toxic metals will inhibit antioxidant uh, enzymes like superoxide dismutase. And you can see there the um, glutathione, how it could deplete that as well. It will disrupt the protein metabolism that we talked about on the slide before, uh, which involves calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. And basically, it will also displace these minerals from where they were originally because of the presence and just um, uh, space occupant occupancy of the toxic metals themselves. So neurotoxic metals, the ones that will affect the nervous system, pretty much across the blood-brain barrier are mercury, lead, aluminum, and manganese. Now, aluminum is a perfect example because aluminum is not a heavy metal, but it certainly is a toxic metal. So there would be example of the other side of the coin. Of course, um, zinc too is considered a heavy metal, but not a toxic metal. And of course, without it, we would be not able to initiate uh, three to 400 chemical reactions per second, let alone, as most of you are aware, its presence intercell in intercellularly will stop the replication of pretty much all viruses. So these effects of neurotoxic metals are both functional, meaning they can cause actual uh, neurofibrillary tangles that can cause the, the uh, um, uh, loosening of the neurons, et cetera, and they are also functional, so they'll stop the good transmission uh, of nerve uh, propagation. So chronic low-level exposure, there can be a relatively slow accumulation in the central nervous system, and this relatively slow exposure can delay the expression of toxic effects. For example, um, you get these exposures all day long, into many, many areas, which we'll discuss some of them today. Some say, well, you know, I've never really played with mercury. I don't, I never had lead or any of these aluminum products or stuff. That doesn't matter. Just by the ongoing small amounts of exposure, 
it, depending on the individual's detoxification capabilities, these will accumulate and no one ever knows, and like in any disease, the straw that breaks the camel's back and causes symptomatology. And the other part of this um, slide that I want to call attention to and come back to is that low level exposure can do damage years and years, years in the future. And low level exposure itself can be toxic enough to cause some serious consequences. We'll show you later. So these are the neurotoxic metals. Then you have the immunotoxic effects. And this is just showing how mercurials and what mercury can do, not only to the neurotoxic area, but also what it does to ruin the lymphocytes. And of course, the, the acquired immune system, IgM, IgG levels can be seriously effective, as you can see in this JAMA article of 2003. Um, and the different types of mercury, which we'll discuss in a minute, can cause um, serious changes uh, that will affect their uh, capability of mounting a good immune response. Again, let's take today, if you have a patient with any type of immunologic compromise, you know, A, they don't do well with certain diseases. Now, you can imagine if they also have mercury um, toxicity, they will do very poorly with certain diseases unless these, uh, it is removed. So the other thing which is of extreme importance is the other uh, uh, end of the coin, which is the initial primary response that the immune system has that occurs within minutes to hours when a pathogen is presented to the immune system. That is the innate immune system. The innate immune system is that which responds without knowing pretty much that they've seen the pathogen in the past. There is no IgG, there is no IgM. But if there is a failure of the innate immune system, then it will be turned over to the other. We want a strong innate immune system. We want one that's like a child where we can fight off these uh, different types of exposures we have every day. Well, as you can see, arsenic, mercury, cadmium, lead, nickel, and tin all can compromise the innate immune system. So I know some of you who already do some testing, you'll sometimes uh, look at it and say, oh, they only have a little nickel, a little tin, big deal. No, it is a big deal because they will decrease the macrophage and natural killer cells. That is your front line against this and pretty much cancer as well in the beginning stages anyway. And otherwise, these will reduce your resistance to bacterial, protozoa, and, and fungal uh, um, invasion. And in your antiviral status and will be so definitely reduced. And then what happens? If this is compromised, then it's handed over to the, the acquired immune system, which, of course, you saw the other metals in the slide before can also compromise that. So here's um, the other thing that happens, and not only reactive oxygen species uh, are, are, are created, you know that if there is too much reactive oxygen species created, you're going to get a um, inflammation. And we pretty much also know that all of the um, diseases that we know of today, the chronic ones, heart, cancer, and on and on, autoimmunity, which we'll show are based in some ongoing inflammatory response. And I think this pretty much shows what's happening and how cytokines interact with the reactive oxygen species and what happens at the end of the day when these uh, specialized white blood cells fail, um, the inflammatory response increases. And as we increase even our cytokine response to try to combat it, we end up with this kind of problem, another way just of looking at the issue. Let's for a moment just look at uh, autoimmune disease and how that happens. And you'll see all the way to the left, you'll get a toxic chemical, um, which we, we, we're we now talking about toxic metals. It'll get into the uh, tissue. It will induce an antigen release. Um, and then, of course, the self, these antigens are released. And eventually, uh, you get the production of antibodies against that tissue. Well... Is that okay? In certain respects, of course, it's okay. We want an antibody response. But when we have an exaggerated antibody uh, response, which is going to happen when you have chronic toxic metal um, uh, in, inhabiting your body, it's going to continue this cascade on and on and on, 
creating a production of antibodies towards um, uh, towards the tissue. And eventually, of course, you lose what autoimmunity is all about. Um, you begin to lose uh, uh, that n knowledge of self. And when there's no knowledge of self, then the any one of the 84 autoimmune disease can express itself. Uh, a different depiction from one of the Gov sites um, on the bottom, you'll see it, how it fans out from the same exposure. Um, and then whether genetic factors uh, can break these down or how fast we can get rid of them, um, what metabolites we, we, we have. And then again, of course, what we said, the oxidative stress, the antigen production, the activation. And of course, here we come, the inflammatory cytokines and the antibody production. And all we've got is inflammation, autoimmune uh, reactivities, and a vicious cycle, um, which is typical um, uh, bane of those that treat autoimmunity dis as well as the rheumatologists that have to deal with this all the time. And often it's a matter of trying to reduce um, the inflammatory response in these autoimmune disease with either dampening the immune response with, you know, things like Humira, et cetera, or using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories occasion the steroid. Uh, ours is a, this evening is trying to say, let's look and see what may be initiating and affecting this and the toxic metals do. So if these patients have toxic metals, in addition to your typical typical armamentarian, you'll have the ability by by phase three of these uh, conferences in three months to remove and safely do that and know how to do that. So oxygen stress, organ uh, toxicity, following exposure to heavy metals, and of course, where do you get them? Well, human exposure is everywhere. Diet, you eat it. Medicines, we all know that many of the um, immunizations have toxic metals and mercury, et cetera. Except different medicines have uh, these toxic, toxic things in them as well. And however you get exposed at the end of the day, uh, you get toxic, toxicity of the organs that we started to talk about before. The only one that wasn't presented before was the skin, and we do see toxic metal abnormalities and toxicities ex express themselves in certain skin rashes and problems of that nature. Again, this is just another depiction of how the free radicals begin to cause oxidative stress and, of course, create these oxidative damage in both the lipid protein and DNA. What ends up when you do that? Well, of course, the cell membrane damage we talked about, uh, changes in the proteins, and of course, carcinogenesis. Um, this is the um, uh, uh, um, a depiction of what happens of vascular aging, um, a little more uh, than for tonight's lecture, but certainly the concept of the same when you start to damage the endothelial lining um, that's the beginning of blood flow abnormalities. It is the beginning of most blood pressure issues. It is the beginning of coronary artery disease. And it lends itself, of course, to the same processes, the inflammation, the oxidative stress. And then eventually, we even end up with cellular senescence and a dysregulated autophagy. You don't get rid of the dead cells. You don't get rid of the senescent cells. Again, a topic for uh, and perhaps later on in the lecture series, but certainly you can see that it can start at the just the one cell lining that inhabits pretty much the 74,000 miles that make up our vasculature, and that can lead to, with toxic metals, these abnormalities that we've been talking about. I've used this um, uh, illustration before. I like it. I've used it for years because... It gives you the idea of the person that you're dealing with in your practice. And it just reminds you that, you know, people are much like a barrel and into the barrel. They put a lot of different problems like the toxic metals. We're not going to call them um, heavy metals. They do get hit with pesticides and solvents and they eat foods inappropriately too much and gluten and everything else, fried food preservatives, additives, phthalates and the plastics go into the system. Um, then, of course, you have the electronic magnetic fields, whether you fly or, or what, uh, other exposures that you have, stress, which it really inhabits pretty much everyone in this country and other world at this moment, 
allergens also add to this barrel of, of problems, hormones inappropriately metabolized. That's right. Even if you give someone a hormone, it's not metabolized properly. It in itself can become a uh, toxic element to the body. And of course, so many people have a dysbiotic uh, gut, and which means you don't make the neurotransmitters properly. You don't have a good immune response. And so that, along with eating oxidized fats, you know, lots of caffeine, although I do have to have my coffee, please. Um, and this is what happens. Look on the bottom, you see the line that starts to fill. And every day you fill it more and more and more until you get to exactly what we've been talking about all night. And that's immunotoxicity, uh, genotoxicity and carcinogenesis, reproductive problems, uh, neuro, uh, neurotoxicity, endocrine, uh, hepato and nephro. And that's what happens. Um, so by now you should start to get the feel how these toxic metals are like seriously causing a lot of problems. So let's just look at the toxic man for one minute. This should be what we all, which should be like, no toxins, no toxic metals, and that's nobody. There isn't a human on the earth that is like this, perhaps not even the baby, because there are studies that show when they looked at 100 uh, baby samples of the, of the umbilical cord and the placenta from uh, in the environmental working group, all of them had a certain amount of phthalates, all of them had mercury, so I don't think we even enter this world looking like this. Um, so we can take a look at the, what the, where the damage organs can occur. We do know in lead, it can pass the blood brain barrier, get into the brain. We certainly know um, uh, that it can uh, affect the bones, the spine. It can definitely affect the kidneys. And, the, and obviously uh, this is the repositories um, where it goes. And lead seems to be the longest lasting of the toxicities. It stays in the bloodstream for about 23 days, maybe maximum. And then it tends to depart and go into these uh, reservoir organs. Mercury, of course, is also the brain. We've shown it is neurotoxic already, the kidneys and the heart. Look at arsenic. Arsenic is... Uh, so in the uh, in the um, uh, liver, in the lungs, and in the kidneys as well. Cadmium, um, same thing, lungs, liver, heart, kidneys, long bones, and in this case, um, even can, can uh, start to accumulate in, in the testes. Aluminum, uh, brain, of course, long bones, um, lungs, and liver. Iron, when you have too much of it, of course, and that's why we always test and you will hopefully always be testing for ferritin to make sure it's not staying in the long bones like we see or in the uh, in the liver, which we often see when when the uh, liver uh, enzymes be become abnormal. In this case, the spleen, too, as well as the lungs. Now, this is um, what we're going to see now is typically the typical human. Um, they don't have one thing. They have, for example, lead and mercury. And then they'll have lead, mercury, and arsenic, and pretty much everyone has. And then they have lead, mercury, arsenic, and cadmium. And there's lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, and aluminum. You can see pretty much most of the organ systems have been invaded with these displacing, dysfunctional toxic metals um, uh, and also inhibiting of a good protocol, like we said. Here's even iron with lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, aluminum, iron. Without looking, you'll never know that these are there. And we'll talk about how to look. But I did say earlier that um, um, uh, these are problematic in even low doses. And if you look at the doses here, um, you could see infertility in men, in nephropathy, at 40 micrograms of lead per deciliter, really low levels. Um, and, and you can see even death in you know, very um, young individuals, by the time you're hitting about 130 to 140 micrograms of mercury in the bloodstream. And you can see pretty much um, as people that do anti-aging medicine, I think it's clear on the right side that you start to lose longevity. It says it there at even 60 micrograms per deciliter. That's not a lot of lead. And if you've never looked and never checked, then you'll never know that whether you have it or not. And everyone listening to this tonight, if you have not or are not undergoing some methodology to remove it, have these toxic metals in their system. 
So one of the things that we also have, they have looked at um, in the American Journal of, of, of uh, Cardiology back in 1999 is that um, idiopathic um, uh, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, um, they found in the endomyocardial tissue uh, 22,300 times the amount of mercury in these patients. Um, and when it came to um, arsenic, um, we see 250 times. So we're seeing um, uh, antimony 12,840 times. So these metals do get into the heart and they can cause problems. Now, um, IDCM, I mean, it's a small population. You can see it's only 13 that they looked at. Well, I guess this was done at um, um, a postmortem. So, um, I would think that this is probably much more prevalent than we believe. So if you have patients with cardiomyopathy um, and or any type of cardiac issue, including dysrhythmia, unable to determine its origin, uh, toxic metals should be part of your workup like is workup for thyroid and inflammation and the other things. Um, this should also be part. Now, there are several uh, specific uh, 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 vasculotoxic metals, and you should know these because these will affect the brain, these will affect the heart, these affect coronary vascular disease. They are the ones that you see here, um, lead, cadmium, gadolinium, arsenic, mercury, cobalt, and aluminum. And don't forget um, that, um, uh, well, let's go for, to one of the ones that are very important. If you don't measure, you don't know. We quickly, uh, in this day and age, send people for diagnostic study, studies without uh, considering any um, uh, impunity for them. So when you look at gadolinium, which is the typical contrast material um, for an MRI, when you order with and without enhancement, gadolinium enters the system. And unless you've done something to remove it within 24 hours, it too will go out into different tissues, and it definitely is a, um, a vasotoxic metal. Um, and there are specific cases, one which I am a large case that I'm a tox a, a um, uh, expert witness for, uh, that's going on because of gadolinium. The FDA knows gadolinium is toxic and has admitted that it's toxic. It's just that. There is no substitution for that particular contrast material with an MRI at this moment, although they are trying to work on it. So it will become extremely important to you if you have patients that have had an MRI. And I typically ask it pretty much in any of my um, uh, um, histories when I initially meet someone, uh, how many MRIs have you had? How many were with gadolinium? They don't remember, recall, but if they've had even one or two, um, there's an issue um, with having this uh, storage of this gadolinium and causing problems from high blood pressure to heart disease. So here is a, um, uh, an explanation of the lead-induced cascade that causes reactive oxygen species. Um, and this is how it goes. Lead, you get exposed to lead, you get a reactive oxygen production. Um, nuclear factor kappa beta is activated, nitric oxide starts to decrease, um, and you get pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, adhesion molecules, your LDL begins to oxidize. And by the way, LDL oxidation is the only time that it causes heart disease. That's when it creates a foam cell, as you might recall. Um, you get endothelial, that one cell lining injury, vascular remodeling, platelets begin to aggravate and to activate and aggregate. Um, you start to get vasoconstriction um, and you don't retain the adrenergic activity. And then what do you have? Hypertension, arteriosclerosis, which is, which is heart disease, of course, and you can get clots. And that's how lead does it, even in small amounts. Um, mercury uh, is another problem which we see. Um, organic mercury, which is in fish and vaccines, is eliminated um, through the fecal route and can you can only access it through hair and whole blood, not for this lecture. Um, but in urine, you can see mercury vapor, skin lightning creams, amalgams. So even small concentrations of mercury which is the background level in the U.S. population, the absence of amalgam fillings means 
there is some mercury. Let me do it differently so it makes sense. Elemental mercury is the most common form of mercury. It's a metallic, pretty much silvery liquid. Some also know it as quicksilver. It does cross the blood-brain barrier. It does cross the placenta. That's why they found it in kids when they were born. It is a potent neurotoxin and, of course, will affect the central nervous system. Inorganic mercury, which is red, is found in things like disinfectants, fungicides, and it's even found in, you know, even school labs, like science labs in school. It's the least toxic, the inorganic mercury, of the three forms. And the third form is the organic mercury. It's also known as methyl mercury, and you find that in the environment. That's in the fish. Uh, that's the most common exposure. By the way, it too crosses the blood-brain barrier and the placenta. So as a summary on it, elemental mercury and organic mercury both go into through the blood-brain barrier. So here are the, a, the cardiovascular effects of lead, mercury, arsenic, and cadmium. Uh, they lead to increase in death. They will affect the beta adrenergic receptors. Um, and of course, unless you're doing ANS, autonomic nervous system testing, um, you'll have to be very astute to know that. Um, cadmium is in cigarettes. As you know, it's in the air. You ingest it. Um, there is so many different sources. We'll go through a few of these in a moment. You can end up with a MI, tachycardia, heart, uh, high blood pressure. Uh, you can get accelerated arterial sclerosis and the car carotids as well. Um, it'll affect use of tra calcium channel blockers. They're not as used as much as the other used to, but they're still used readily. And of course, you'll get DNA damage eventually, and you'll get all sorts of other problems. Again, trying to impress you the importance of looking for and acknowledging the presence of these metals. Even in small quantities of blood lead levels, one more time, there's a 68% increased risk of cancer. That's a lot. So that's a lot. And it's a great insurance policy to be able to determine whether the patient has it. There is a 46% increase of early death, and there's a 33% increase in cardiovascular disease. That is a huge thing for just a small amount of lead. So even when we begin to talk next time about how do you uh, learn it, how do you disguise it, how do you find out about it, what do we, um, uh, um, even if it's in the low ranges, when it comes to these toxic metals, we, I'm trying to impress on you that even small amounts are predictably a problem with the patient's ongoing health and their longevity. So uh, common sources, toxic metals are these. Let's talk about them. It's common sources of arsenic or pesticides, apple juice, fungicides, shellfish, wood preservatives, smelting, lots in Chinese medicines. Be careful of these. Um, some of them are fine. Depends where if they've been tested in this country. Uh, by the way, pretty much all vitamins too, even though they can be harvested, many of them or the product we brought in the United States, the actual production or creation of the product for use in a capsule pretty much most of the time goes to China. So you have to make sure that the uh, product is not tainted with some sort of toxic metal. Insist on toxic metal testing like I do for the products I have made for myself. Um, Non-organic chicken um, is a source of arsenic. Uh, they used to use roxazone, which was a arsenic for um, the chickens because it increased the, um, killed the bow weevil or the weevils and pests and pests inside these chickens. And of course, um, they got fatter to the point where they fell over. And because of the requirement of the American public to have more and more meat on these chickens, that's why they did that. But then again, you were eating arsenic. Wood preservatives is old. Typically, most of the wood preservatives don't have arsenic any longer. Cadmium is seen in welding, electroplating, pest, pesticides, fertilizers, smoking cigarettes. Yes, including e-cigarettes, auto emissions, mining, of, uh, burning of coal. And there'll be a trace amount in certain foods like uh, leafy vegetables, potatoes, grains and seeds, liver and kidney, some of the crustaceans, mollusks and drinking water. 
Uh, common sources of mercury, we started to go through them, but batteries, pesticides are very common. Vish we talked about, oil-based mascara. So um, women, if you use oil-based mascara, be careful because they can be sources of arsenic. Uh, just like uh, 32 lipsticks of red color showed to contain lead. Uh, amalgam fillings, of course, uh, which hopefully no one is putting in anymore, although there still are, and some agricultural operations. Lead is found in many of these products like table oil, ceramics, drinking water. You know, there is plenty of plumbing still with lead light, uh, lead pipes, bullets, of course. And by the way, for those of you that keep pushing bone broth, as one of the best things ever for people to eat and drink. It's a great source of protein and blah, blah, blah. Um, I never give my patients bone, bone broth, rarely, because it's an amazing source of lead. And when I've tested patients that have a lot of them um, or drink a lot of bone broth, they have a significant amount of lead. Remember, you can say, well, that's just a little bit. A little bit reduces someone's life expectancy, as we saw. And of course, lead sometimes is in some particles and aerosols. Well, we're not going to do part two tonight, of course. Uh, let's go back um, and stop the um, broadcasting. And I come back here and let me see if I can share my screen. I'm going to share my web. Hold on one minute. Okay. So do I have anybody that has any questions so far on part one? And hopefully you see the importance and the, the need for us to be able to determine the human body's exposure to these toxic metals. And regardless of how much there is, we should be doing something about them. Anybody have a question? No questions. Isn't that nice? No questions. Is it because you're totally bedazzled or is it because you don't know what to ask? But okay, so no questions is good. So you know um, part two is coming up uh, next month. I don't know the exact date, uh, but that notice will be going out several times. I hope that uh, you'll be able to attend. Part two will be is how do you diagnose? How do you understand um, what you use to diagnose? How do you read and understand the testing you get back? That's all going to be part of part two. One last time before I say goodnight, is there any other, any question from anybody that's watching this evening? This uh, will be available to Access Laboratories, um, this particular webinar, so that if you need to look at it, you wanna look at it later with your staff or whatever, please feel free to contact them and I'm sure they'll be glad to, glad to share it with you. With that said, I appreciate everyone joining us Hi. tonight. And yes, someone has a question? This is John Lavery from Allen, Texas. I have two questions. All right. Hi, John. How you doing? Good. What do you got? Uh, would elevated malandalide, how do you say that? Uh, malandalide, malandalide. Yeah. Are urine levels be an indication to test for toxic metals? Yes, of course. We just showed that. Now, we don't All know right. for 100% that that's what's causing it. But certainly, if you're seeing lipid peroxidation, it would make sense to determine whether that lipid peroxidation was coming from eating crappy foods, constantly uh, bad fats, or was it from, um, uh, or was it from a, a toxic metal that's occupying part of their space? Okay, uh, would if if okay if these levels are useful, could we use them to measure the effectiveness of chelation? Yeah, you can. That's exactly what you're doing. The very first time we'll talk uh, later is not just determining whether it's there, it's your benchmark uh, for your treatment protocols, which will be the third part to determine whether you've done a good job or not. All right, I have another question. I, and I appreciate the comments about the autoimmune disease. I like that, thank you. You're uh, welcome. Is there a place for toxic metal screening in patients with joint prosthesis? Well, yeah, it depends what they're using for the joint prosthesis. If it's a, a metal that we can, like titanium, we can assay for that. Uh, so some yes, it, some no. I mean, right. in teeth, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Depends on the metal itself. Okay. The thing about it is, is if it's yes, 
Uh, what signs and symptoms would you be looking out for to heighten your suspicion to do that kind of testing? Oh, you mean in someone who has a prosthesis or just in general? Right. And they come, right. In with the, yeah, they come in with funky types of, you know, fatigue, yeah. this, Jake's and Aids. Would, and would that come that to, to mind? Me, hey. That to me is more than enough. Anything that goes from a over, overt, you know, neurologic or immunologic abnormality found either by symptom or by, or by blood test to that of something that's more, you know, is uh, subdued something like being fatigued, not thinking clearly. Everybody's oh, it's probably testosterone, Bob. This, but it can be a toxic metal, as we showed tonight, that could be causing these, you know, these um, uh, vague, which we call vague symptomatology. Any vague symptomatology that you can't place into a specific uh, difficulty or problem, then I would say the toxic metal should be evaluated. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. On the behalf of Access Laboratories, I'm so happy to have been able to present this to you. Look forward to seeing everybody next month. God bless. See you next week. Next month. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night.